Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's show. I'm Jacob Hansen, the host of Thoughtful Faith, and I am joined today by my friend Seth Garrett. Seth, how you doing? Hey, Jacob. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, everybody, uh, Seth and I have uh, been kind of interlocutors online um, in my Facebook group, Thoughtful Saints, and uh, we finally decided to put together a debate over uh, a topic that we sometimes go back and forth on. And so today we're actually going to be doing a formal debate between the two of us yes. about uh, what better explains reality, atheism or theism. Um, in this debate, we're going to, uh, you guys will all witness, we will go after each other's arguments really hard. Hopefully we won't go after each other personally, because I don't think that's a good debate tactic. Uh, but we will go after each other's point of view very aggressively. Um, but I hope everyone knows that, uh, at least from my part, and I think Seth shares this, that we don't have anything personal against each other. We just are interlocutors over ideas that we disagree on. So hopefully we Absolutely. can we can model that in this conversation. Um, sure. just so, as a matter of housekeeping, um, we'll have 15 minutes for opening statements after which we will have three successive rounds of rebuttals where we each will have four minutes to offer a quick rebuttal, uh, to, uh, each other. We then will have a 10 minute cross examination each where each of us will have 10 minutes to cross examine the other. And then at last we will have eight minutes to wrap up with some closing statements. And that will be the format of our debate, uh, tonight. So as we uh, have, have come up with this debate, um, uh, Seth has decided that he wants to, to go first. So uh, Seth, when you are ready, uh, just let me know and uh, we'll get started. Do you have anything you want to say before we get started here? Um, I think I'm about ready to go. Okay. And, and just so everyone knows also, I just realized I forgot to introduce, uh, Seth runs a YouTube channel called Transcendent Philosophy. He also has a blog where he blogs on uh, topics related to uh, philosophy and other, other issues. And uh, so if anybody wants to find you online, where do you suggest they go, uh, Seth? Um, yeah, that's a good question. If you search Transcendent Philosophy, you'll probably find either my Facebook or my YouTube or my blog. Transcendent philosophy. Hopefully, that'll get you in the right spot. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. All righty. Well, any any other final thoughts before uh, we get into the the first round here? Um, uh, I don't think so. I think I'm ready to go. Awesome. And you have decided you 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 decided no slides on this. I have some slides with mine, but you had decided no slides on yours. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be good. Perfect. All righty. Well, then, if you are ready, I will get the timer ready, and we will begin now. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Seth, and I'm here to argue on behalf of atheism to the question, which better explains reality, theism or atheism? So when we're talking about reality, this is a big topic. You know, the philosopher Wittgenstein, he said that reality was basically all that is the case, right? All that is the case, it's the sum of all the facts. And so we're dealing with a lot of stuff. But the, but the real question is, how do we get to those facts? And that's a question of epistemology. And so when we're debating theism versus atheism, we've got God-based epistemologies and we've got God-less epistemologies. And so let's go through a deep dive examining the different types of theistic epistemologies and we'll see how good they are at understanding and explaining reality. And then we can contrast that with, you know, God-less uh, epistemologies that don't rely on supernatural explanations, and we'll see how, how they compare. So the first off, uh, if we're going to look at the history of theism, one of the most striking features is mythology. And if we're going to like look at what mythology is, it seems like a theistic epistemology. And But if we dig deeper into how it functions, it's a little bit weird. If you look across many different religions, there's kind of a pattern that starts to emerge. And that pattern could be reduced to something like the following. I'm an ancient person, and I look out into the world, and I see a phenomenon. I'm like, huh, how, how can I understand this phenomenon? And then what, is the, what do they do with mythology? They make something up. There's plenty of examples of people just making up explanations. For example, the Egyptian religion they saw a phenomenon of rivers that were overflowing. 
If you're an Egyptian, you're like, huh, I wonder why the river is overflowing. It must be because of the gods. The gods have these divine buckets of water and they're dumping it in the river. That's how they understand reality by making up a story. Uh, what about the Greeks? The Greeks, they saw the sun and the moon traveling through the sky. They see the phenomenon and they're like, huh, how do I explain this? Then they make up a story. The sun and the moon, they ride on chariots. These divine chariots are taking the sun god and the moon god across the sky. Fancy that. Their understanding of reality is based on making something up. Uh, what else? We've got stories about fire. Fire is such an interesting phenomenon. Where does it come from? They make it up. Native Americans, they see a mountain. Where does the mountain come from? There's a snake underground and he's shaking up the earth, making the mountain. Where does lightning come from? It comes from Zeus, right? And this, this pattern is all throughout religion. It's all throughout the Bible. It's all throughout Mormonism. But here is what I want to tell you. This is the most important takeaway. This, myth, this mythology epistemology, it fundamentally is structured like a God of the gaps argument. What is a God of the gaps argument? It's when you see something you don't understand and you say that is because of God, right? And so the God of the gaps argument, they're constantly targeting our ignorance, right? That's what the ancients did. So the ancients, they had all of this ignorance and they're like, huh, all of this stuff is because of the gods. But we're going to contrast that to non-theistic epistemology. Let's understand this phenomenon naturally. Okay, so we've got scientific explanations for the moon and the, the stars and the sun. There's no divine chariots. It's just conservation of momentum. So all of these theistic epistemologies are getting debunked over time. And the natural epistemologies are filling in the gap. And so which is more accurately understanding reality, the debunked theist epistemologies or the substantiated natural epistemologies? Now, the problem with modern theism, <laughs> modern theists, they no longer do these ancient mythologies. They, modern the, uh, theism, they've given up on young earth. They've given up on, you know, creation in seven days. And now they're targeting what we don't know. They're targeting the Big Bang. They're targeting abiogenesis, right? They're all, theism, the entire project of theism is one massive God of the gaps project. And so as our, as our knowledge increases, there's less and less is ignorance. But, and so the theists are constantly moving the goalpost towards that ignorance. And so the problem with this approach, the problem with this theistic epistemology is the pattern is already proven. We already know where this leads. Every time you do God of the gaps, the natural explanations keep coming in. And so theism, it's just waiting for more natural explanations to kick out those new arguments. And eventually theism is just going to get completely kicked out of the box. So I think it's clear that natural epistemologies are better at understanding and explaining reality. Now, does theism have anything to offer other than mythology? Well, lots of theists, they rely on spiritual epistemology. What is a spiritual epistemology? It's where you have these spiritual experiences and you say, this is evidence of something supernatural. So they are thinking that reality has supernatural stuff based on their experience. The question is, how reliable is this epistemology? If this is a good epistemology, then maybe they understand reality. If it's a bad epistemology, maybe they don't. So let's look at some examples. Out-of-body experiences. We have already scientifically explained these. We understand that in the ears, we've got the vestibular system. The vestibular system, the water moving around in your ears, it helps you calculate your position in the world. What happens if this system malfunctions? If your water throws an incorrect signal, suddenly your position in space goes outside of your body. That triggers the hallucination of an out-of-body experience. 
Natural explanation, kicking out the spiritual experience. Uh, Near-death experiences, very similar, brain phenomena. Demons, we've got explanations like sleep paralysis, epilepsy. What about revelation? We've got, we've got evidence of hallucination and even cultural hallucinatory influences. What about healing? We've got placebo effect. We've got statistics. You can go look at a hospital. Does prayer work? Do, do the patients recover quicker? No, they don't. So natural explanations are kicking out the supernatural ones. Um, we've got lots of psychological explanations for types of guidance. Sometimes you feel guided in your words. Well, that's a psychological unconscious. Sometimes you feel guided about the future. You've got a premonition. Oh, there's a warning. We have unconscious pattern recognition that gives us, the, our, our psyche is all about pattern recognition and patterns, it's about the future. It makes sense. Sometimes people have like guidance from a feeling in their gut. Well, we've discovered in your gut, you literally have like a second brain of neuronal activity. So it makes sense that there's guidance coming from your gut, literally. All right. And one of the most important ones is selection bias, which is related to prayer. A lot of theists, they'll have a prayer and they'll say, huh, I really need something. I need to find my keys. And they'll, they'll have this prayer and then... Very soon after, the results of the prayer come in. I found my keys. This is such a great experience. I can't believe God answered my prayer. Is this good evidence? I would say that selection bias is causing this phenomenon. Selection bias is when you narrow your focus to just one piece of evidence and you ignore everything else. So if you look at this prayer in isolation, it looks so impressive. But when you realize, actually, Every theist is saying thousands of prayers, thousands, if not millions of prayers, unanswered, fail to achieve a result. And the theists, they don't keep track of those. They just make excuses. Oh, I didn't have enough faith. I wasn't focused enough. I'm not righteous enough. And so they narrow the focus to that one coincidence. If you take the one successful prayer and you divide it by all the failed prayers, it looks a lot more like a coincidence. Um, feelings of the Holy Ghost, we can reduce that to the elevation emotion, and even prophecy. Prophecy, the track record of theistic prophecy is not good. Let's just put it that way. Uh, there's a database of Mormon patriarchal blessings. Every generation of Mormons, there's been a prophecy that says, you will live to see the second coming. But we know all of those prophecies have failed. So all of these spiritual epistemologies debunked by natural explanations. Theism is not understanding reality. All right. So not very good on, uh, not very good on mythology, not very good on spiritual epistemology. What about morality? If they get anything right, at least theism should get morality right. But the track record on morality is not good either. What a history of theistic morality. They support tribalism, better than thou perspectives. They support racism, sexism, homophobia, slavery, genocide, jihad, beheadings, witch burnings, the Inquisition, where you torture and execute people who don't agree. Lots of bad stuff. Uh, even human sacrifice, the, like execution for minor things like working on Sunday. Moral... Morally abhorrent behavior is all a part of the history of theism. All right, so they didn't get that one either. Now let's, um, let's test this a little harder, right? There's a concept called the law of non-contradiction. Anything that violates the non law of non-contradiction, it can't exist. What is the law? Things can only be true or false. You can't be both. You have to pick one. And is it true or is it false? Anything that is a contradiction, it can exist because of this principle. So the question for theism is, is your definition of God a contradiction? If so, your God does not exist. And then we have to look for some definition of God that isn't a contradiction. And we'll see how hard that is. Now, in the Bible, there have been at least 637 contradictions documented. 
lots of contradictions. Now, what are some examples? A lot of bad examples, right? Does God love children or does God hate children? What, what are you doing in Egypt, God? The Pharaoh messed up, right? The Pharaoh pissed you off. Okay, punish the Pharaoh. Why do you have to kill all the first, firstborn children of Egypt? Do you, do you actually love children or not? What about individualism? Do you punish people for their own sins or for someone else's sins, right? Uh, what about genocide? Why are you telling the Israelites to genocide everyone? It, it doesn't make sense. Slavery, honesty, racism, God being the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lots of contradictions just in Christianity. That's not it. What about Hinduism? Hinduism, does God create or does he not create? Is, is this energy or is it not energy? Is this stuff real or is it not real? Is it just an illusion? Does God have a form or is he formless? Lots of contradictions in Hinduism. Islam, is man made from clay or is he not made from clay? Is religion about force or is it not about force? Does Allah forgive or does Allah not forgive? Is wine good or is wine bad? Just contradictions all over the place. So the history of theism looks like it's pointing to gods that don't exist. And if gods don't exist, theism is not understanding reality. Now, if theism is getting so many things wrong, why is that? Well, there's been lots of science to investigate this, and it seems to reduce to better safe than sorry epistemology. What does that mean? When we're doing our pattern recognition, you can be accurate or you can be overly sensitive, right? If there's rustling in the bushes, do you interpret it as a lion or do you just ignore it? If you have overly sensitive pattern recognition, you see things that aren't there. You interpret the signal as a lion or a predator. And so because of this, they're getting, they're, they're seeing things that aren't there because of this pattern recognition. And if you're seeing things that aren't there, you're not, see, you're not understanding reality correctly. And so the final thing is thought experiment testing. We can do if the, we can do an if then analysis of these definitions of God. If God is good, what should the world look like, right? And we know that there's evil exists, so lots of definitions of God get debunked. That's a problem of evil. But I, I, I would challenge anyone to try to come up with a definition of God that doesn't have a contradiction under this framework of testing. And uh, so in conclusion, theism, it doesn't do very well on the mythological data. It doesn't do well on spiritual data, doesn't do well on moral data. Its logic is pretty contradictory. And so why do they make these mistakes? It's because their pattern recognition seems to be a little bit off. And so if we look out in the world, we can tell that it seems like this is all the non-God explanations are making a lot more sense than the God explanations. And so I think we can safely conclude that atheism is more in harmony with our understanding of reality. It explains it better. Okay, thank you very much. Very good, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and get myself prepped here. All righty, everybody. So t this debate uh, that we're having today is about what best explains reality, atheism or theism. And when discussing reality, um, we could discuss a lot of different things. You know, is consciousness real? Is suffering real? Is happiness real? After all, you know, you can doubt your eyes, but can you doubt the existence of your own suffering? Um, and I thought about going deep into the nature of reality and why theism better accounts for it, but I decided to limit the focus in this debate to something that both myself and my opponent agree is real, and that is the physical universe. In, in what follows, I will be making a logical case for why theism actually better accounts for our physical universe than does atheism. So instead of approaching this for from the standpoint of epistemology, I'm going to approach this from the standpoint of uh, ontology and science. What, what does science point to as a better explanation for the physical world? Now, in this debate, I'm not going to argue for any particular conception of God. Instead, I'm simply going to argue that it is more rational to believe that the universe that we observe is the product of a mind's design than of random chance. Tonight is not a debate about theology. 
It is, uh, it is not a debate about the nature of the mind behind the universe. Instead, we are just examining if the universe is better explained as the product of a mind or if it is better explained as the product of random chance. So I'm going to bring up a, a slide here on the screen and let's you know review my argument. Here it is. Uh, my argument can be summed up as follows. The first premise is that anything that comes into existence is either the product of random chance or design. Uh, premise two is that the known universe came into existence. Premise three is that the known universe is not the product of random chance, and therefore the known universe is the product of design. Now, uh, Let's take a look at each of these premises, starting with the first. Anything that comes into existence is either the product of random chance or design. So I want you to imagine a pool table, and on that pool table are pool balls. The arrangement of those pool balls is either the product of random chance or else, the pool, uh, or else they are the product of design. So let me pull this slide back up again. In looking at these pool balls, um, sorry. Uh, now, 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 real quick, you can imagine looking at this group of pool balls in no particular order, and understandably, you would infer that they just happen to be this way by chance. However, on the other hand, one moment. Um, on the other hand, if the pool balls had been laid out in just the right way as to spell I love you, you would rightfully infer the best explanation to be that a mind was involved in the arrangement of that pattern. What other possibility is there? The balls are either arranged by random chance or else they are arranged by design. So unless my opponent can show that there is some other way that things can arrange themselves that are not ultimately either design or random chance, then he will have to accept premise one, that the only, uh, um, the only way he can refute premise one is to provide a third option that is neither design nor chance. So that's the only way that he's going to be able to, um, to defeat premise one. However, I can hear my opponent and others right now saying, but what about evolution? Well, I don't think people who raise that objection have thought very hard about the problem. Evolution is a process within biology. It's like a biological machine that itself must have either been designed or arose by pure chance. Here is what I mean. Let me pull up the slide. It's like saying that because you have machines that make cars, no mind was involved in the making of the cars. But that only leads us to ask if the machine itself was the product of random chance or design. Also, what is it that caused these machines to exist in such a way that they produce cars instead of random assortments of metal and rubber? Chance or design? Do you see how my opponent can't appeal to evolution to solve the problem? Are we to assume that biological processes are, uh, are the product of random chance? No, they're not. Biology is not the product of chance, but of the laws of chemistry. And chemistry emerges from the laws of physics. But obviously, physics is the product of random chance, right? No. And that's the shocking discovery of what? Not religious superstition, but of science. In physics and engineering, there is a technical concept known as fine tuning. This is not some woo-woo religious term, but a technical designation given to a narrow set of outcomes that came from a large scale of possible outcomes. For instance, a key could have a large range of possible shapes but the key to your house is finely tuned to a narrow set of shapes that can open the lock. So how does this apply to the universe? Well, let's look at an example. Let's say that there was a dial in a particular room that would allow for you to set the temperature of that room from anywhere from zero to 10 trillion degrees. Now let's say that you walked into that room 
and it happened to be set at 72 degrees. Now, maybe this happened by chance, but considering such a large amount of possibilities, the temperatures one might uh, that that someone might encounter, this perfectly comfortable temperature setting was most likely not randomly selected, but was probably chosen out of the trillions of possibilities. Now, I want you to imagine a room that has not only that dial, but a dial for oxygen levels, for radiation levels, for gravity levels, and for hundreds of others with massive ranges of possible settings on the dials. Yet when you walk into the room, you find out that all of these dials were set into a range that allowed for you to be there and to comfortably sit in a chair and watch a movie. This is precisely what we see in the laws of physics. They point to a universe that is immensely fine-tuned to allow for the development of life. Stephen Hawking even said, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers, meaning the constants of physics, seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. For instance, if the electric charge of the electron had been only slightly different, stars would have been unable to burn hydrogen and helium, or else they would not have exploded. Sir Fred Hoyle said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Now, at this point, perhaps my opponent will want to move on to uh, premise three, um, which says that the universe uh, did not arrive, or that the universe uh, is the product of random chance. Um, and he'll say, because he doesn't want to disagree with these great scientists about the fine tuning of the universe. Uh, he basically will say that, you know, the dials just, they did, they just came about by random chance that, you know, we're just really, really lucky. Um, but honestly, I don't, I don't have that much faith. Um, however, more likely, uh, he, along with others will say without any evidence that there are nearly infinite universes out there. So that one of these universes just had to come with these finely tuned settings. And we just happen to be in one of those universes, the one that has these settings. This is the multiverse theory, and by definition, it's unscientific, since by definition, you can't detect things outside of our universe. The multiverse is a clear post hoc invention that people made up to avoid the obvious evidence for design in the physical universe. If evidence for design did not exist, the atheist would not have postulated multiple universes. Let me give an example of how silly this kind of argument is. Imagine that you were playing poker with a person and they got royal flushes on every hand during a two-hour game. Now imagine that person saying, I'm not cheating. Nothing strange is going on here. The game is not rigged. There are just nearly infinite universes out there. And we just happen to be in the one where I get all royal flushes on every hand. So, just so everyone knows, appealing to unlimited chances destroys any notion we have about probability because it makes anything that is possible actual. Want to get 100 royal flushes in a row? Just play an infinite number of hands in poker, and eventually it will happen. Don't have flying uni unicorns in this universe? Well, if there are infinite universes, you will have them in one of those universes. Do you see how creating infinite universes where every possible uh, possibility exists creates all sorts of absurd conclusions? Can you not see how this attempt by atheists to postulate wild ideas without evidence of to avoid the obvious implications of a fine-tuned universe? Again, if there is evidence for design, if, or if the evidence for design did not exist, atheists would not have ever postulated multiple universes. Now, there is one last objection my opponent may try to make to the first premise. And he might say that the universe just happens to be this way because it could not be otherwise. But this is absurd. Is my opponent really saying that a life-prohibiting universe is impossible? It's like saying that he can't imagine the possibility of our planet being too close to the sun. It just had to be this way 
There's no reason or evidence to suggest that the laws of the universe had to be the way that they are. And in fact, all of the best science points to the laws, uh, the fact that the laws of the known universe emerged from a time in the distance past into a finely tuned order. So here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to look around. I want you to look at the stars tonight. I want you to look at yourself in the mirror. Look into the eyes of the ones that you love. I want you to think about music, about beauty, about the way the sunlight paints the sky each day. And then I want you to ask yourself, why is this all here? Why is any of it here? Did it have to be this way? Why is it there something rather than nothing? And furthermore, why is the something that exists not random chaos, like a bunch of billiard balls randomly bouncing around, but the rich multi-layered reality that we inhabit? If the universe were the product of random chance, um, is this what we should expect? It didn't have to be this way. Yet here it is, and here you are. So let's review the final argument, or my argument one more time. Premise one is that anything that comes into existence is either the product of random chance or design. The second premise is the known universe came into existence. And premise three is that the known universe is not the product of random chance. And therefore, the known universe is the product of design. This is not a God of the gaps argument. This is an inference to the best explanation based on what we do know, not based on what we don't. And just remember, my opponent tonight only has one option. He must argue that the universe and all aspects of reality, including the epistemology that he's talking about, are the product of random chance. One minute. The universe's intelligibility must come about by random chance. He must believe that the blind random roll of the dice is the reason that we're here. He must choose this option and argue for it because if he does not, there only leaves one other alternative available. And that alternative is what all the evidence points to, that the universe that we inhabit is the product of design. And with that, I yield my time. All righty. So we will now move into the four-minute rebuttal rounds. And so, Seth, you'll have the first four minutes. Let me know when you're ready for me to begin the timer. Hey, okay. Okay. All right, so that was very interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, I appreciate the premises, the argument, the structure, it's very nice. I do have some issues. Uh, premise one, it says uh, everything must be random or designed. Forgive me for not quoting properly. Um, I think there's probably another option, which Jacob kind of alluded to, which is necessity. Either random or by design or by necessity. Um, and when it comes to fine tuning, I think there's a lot to say on this. First of all, one thing that we need to do, <laughs> we need to put fine tuning into context. I think this is another example of selection bias. When we look out into the vast universe, what do we see? There's at least 8 trillion planets like ours. 8 trillion planets like ours. And humanity, we've only existed for the last 6 million years. Out of a 13.7 billion year old universe, that's just a small speck of time. And so when you combine the fact that we're just one in 8 trillion and we're just you know one in 2,000 slices of time, that puts us into a probability space of humanity is just one out of 18 quadrillion slices of space time, right? If you were, <laughs> if you were to say, if there's a poker hand, right? You draw draw a royal flush and it's like, I don't know, it's a one out of 2000 chance of getting a royal flush or whatever. You wouldn't think that that is intelligently designed. That was just luck. One out of 2000, that's just luck. Humanity is one out of 18 quadrillion slices of space time. This universe does not look like it's finely tuned for us. If you were to guess what it's finally tuned for, you might guess something like black holes, galaxies, but not us. Look at Mars. It's like a, a death zone for any, any type of life. 
all of the planets we find are just void of anything that could be beneficial to life. It doesn't make sense to say that it's finely tuned for us. <coughs> and um, I, oh. and according, I do have things to say on the multiverse aspect. Um, according to Sean Carroll, the math for the multiverse is parsimonious. It's not this ad hoc making up stuff. It's building a mathematical model, just like, just like the foundational logic of math Math logic gives rise to an infinite number of integers. Multiverse logic gives rise to an infinite number of multiverses. It's a conclusion of the logic. It's not um, being forced onto reality. And the other thing is there is empirical evidence for the multiverse. Because multiverse is based on inflation. If inflation is eternal, then there are going to be multiverses, uh, infinite multiverses. And the scientists, they have been trying to investigate whether or not there's evidence of inflation and they've come back and found, yes, there is. So there are empirical clues. This is not some baseless hypothesis. But the final thing is we know where fine tuning comes from. We have evolution. Evolution is a series of processes and those processes finally tune things, right? We have and the principles of evolution, they fine-tune everything. They fine-tune culture, they fine-tune language, they fine-tune biology. Why can't the why can't they um also fine-tune chemical evolution for abiogenesis? Why can't why can't evolutionary principles fine-tune physics itself? And maybe there are mm -hmm. oh go ahead, go ahead, you can finish your thought. Um yeah, maybe at base reality, there's an evolution of process evolutionary process where the fine tuning occurs at the level of the laws of physics as well. Okay. And that's your time. If you want to get my time ready to go. All right. So, um, real quick, uh, Seth has talked about, um, that, you know, that the, you know, Oh, if you get a Royal flush, you know, that that's, you know, it's improbable event, but improbable events happen, you know, all the time. I don't think Seth is fully aware of how improbable we're talking here. At some point, things get so improbable that you you think something is going on. It's, it's not like somebody got a royal flush once. It's as if somebody got a royal flush a hundred times in a row. Um, the the fine tuning of the universe is so fine, so perfect, um, le, le tuned. It, it would be like you walked into a room and you found, uh, and this is even way too small of an example, you find dice on a table and all of the dice have the number six up. But there's, this isn't two dice, this isn't 10 dice, this is like 10 billion dice, right? But let's just use 10,000 dice. If you walked into a room and found 10,000 dice laying on a, a, you know, spread all over the floor and they all had the number six on it, you wouldn't look at that and say, oh, well, I guess they just must have rolled out there onto the floor. They, that, that, you know, they just randomly happened to have, uh, uh, you know, come to this pattern. You recognize that, that the, the, the sixes all being up has to be the product of either design or chance. And you would infer design rightly off of that, uh, off of that scenario. So when you're looking at the universe, you find it extremely finely tuned to that, uh, degree. And they're so finely tuned that if you were to have flipped, not even flipped one of the dice to another number, if you had just moved one of those dice just slightly into another position, on the floor, the universe would have ceased to exist as we know it. And not only as we know it, but like in ways where stars wouldn't have formed, uh, chemical, like large scale chemical reactions would never have happened. You wouldn't have had something where life could have even emerged. And so the question is, is why do we have all of this? Why did it come out that way? And for, um, for Seth to say that um, it couldn't be otherwise, well, you're implying that the universe can't be otherwise. And this is what's known as the anthropic principle. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, it's to say that our universe couldn't have been any other way because if it were different, we wouldn't be here to observe it. But that's silly. It's the fact that we are here observing it that makes the whole thing so mysterious. And here's what I mean Imagine a person is standing in front of a firing squad of 50 Navy SEALs. And when they all fire, they all miss. The lucky person, you know, uh, is, is standing there and they say, well, you know, I'm still here, 
So no further explanation is necessary because, you know, uh, because I'm here to observe that they all missed, it couldn't have been otherwise. Do you see how silly this is? Even Richard Dawkins rejects this sort of reasoning that, oh, the universe just had to be this way. There's nothing in there that suggests that the universe has to be this way. And in fact, all of the science points to the fact that the universe didn't have to be this way. It emerged from a point in the, in the past and it emerged in such a way that the constants and quantities of the, of the universe created the laws upon which all of this evolution that he's talking about must run. So if he says that evolution is the product of the fine tuning, he's pointing to the machine that makes the car without recognizing that, well, where did that machine come from? Evolution is predicated on things like bio biological evolution is predicated on chemistry and chemistry is predicated on physics and physics emerges as a consequence of these constants and quantities, which emerged at a finite time in the past. So what emerges is a picture of, yes, things within the universe that that are that uh, build things, but those things themselves require an explanation. And you have um, to say they either came about by chance or by design. And with that, I'll yield my time. All righty. Ready for your next round? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Your time begins now. All right. So I want to highlight what I said in the beginning, that all theistic arguments, or the vast majority, they seem to look like God of the gaps arguments. And these arguments you're hearing today are no different. When <laughs> fine-tuning, this is exactly the location of modern ignorance. Modern theists, they're no longer talking about the stuff we've already discovered. They're using what we don't know to provide evidence for God. But we know where this trajectory goes. Religion, theism, it has a track record of not doing so well on God of the Gaps arguments. Now, I want, I want to re-emphasize this evolutionary principle because I feel like a lot of theists get this wrong. The mutations are random but the selection is not random. The, the process of selecting over time, that's what creates the illusion of design because all of these random mutations are being molded into something specific for the environment. Now, Brian Greene, uh, the, the physicist, Brian Greene, he hypothesized something about like a black hole evolution where maybe these black holes are giving birth to new universes. And if the laws of physics are such that black holes can't form, then that, then that generation, then that lineage of black holes, they die. And so only lineages of universes that have laws of physics compatible with black holes are able to reproduce. And that would go back to saying, maybe our universe is finely tuned for something like black holes, but this is not a theological fine tuning. This is natural fine tuning. We have evidence of natural fine tuning all over the place. We have no evidence for deities performing fine tuning. Um, I also would like to talk a little bit about Isaiah. Something in Isaiah I find really interesting is that he basically says that God, the purpose of creating earth was so that earth would be inhabited, right? So the Bible, it's making, it's making a claim about God. God creates planets to have them be inhabited. Well, if that was the intention of the creation of planets, we should see Mars being inhabited. We should see Venus being inhabited. But we look out and all of these planets, they're all void of life. The hypothesis that God is creating all this stuff to be inhabited is objectively false. And um, with that, I yield back my time. Okay. Yeah, ready. Okay. Three, two, one, go. All righty. So um, is this God of the Gaps logic that I'm using? It's not. Um, I'm actually going to what we do know about causation. And we know that minds can cause things to happen. Okay. So how do we know if a mind has caused something to happen? Well, 
we look for things that are incredibly improbable. For instance, the house that I'm living in, I know that it's been designed because the improbability is ridiculously high that this th stuff emerged by chance because of the order that it takes. Order does not emerge from uh, random processes. And those are the only two options. Evolution is not a third option. Um, so we're not inferring to what we don't know. What we're doing is we're looking at the evidence and what we find at the base of all of these things in physics, when we drill down into to causation, is that we find that our universe emerged in a finely tuned order. And there needs to be an explanation for that fine tuning. And it isn't an inference to, oh, we don't know, therefore God did it. No, it's that we do know that the universe is fine tuned. And the best explanation of that based on what we do know from our uniform and repeated experience is that uh, finely tuned things like keys and houses and other things that are out there are the product of design, okay? So um, also, my opponent has made a lot about sort of ideas that religion has got wrong, quote, quote unquote. Well, first of all, I don't endorse religion. Um, I endorse what is true. And the reality is, is that a lot of religions have had various models to understand the universe and to try and understand the physical nature of the universe. And that's fine. But science itself emerges from a Judeo-Christian tradition and from other religious traditions with the idea that the universe is not the capricious, arbitrary whim of the gods, but rather is the basis of order and law. And they inferred that that was the case about reality, largely because that's what the scriptures teach, is that there is an order to the universe given by a lawgiver. And so because they expected to find law in nature, they began to study, and what did they find? They found that nature is indeed not arbitrary, but that it is predicated on laws. So what we observe in the physical universe is, is not not unexpected given uh, a theistic worldview coming from uh, a Judeo-Christian worldview where you expect the universe to operate based on laws. And in fact, historically, that's why science got started. They began to look for law in the universe and what did they find? They found law. And But the thing is, is if you follow those laws back, you eventually get to the roots of physics, which chemistry emerges from physics and from there comes biology and other things. But when you go down to the root, the question is, what do you find there? What you find there is what you least expect. It isn't random chaos. It's something that looks designed. Don't forget my argument. It's either design or else it's random chance. That's it. Those are the only possibilities that exist out there for why the universe exists the way that it does. 20 seconds. Um, and with that, I will yield my time. All right, Seth, you have one more round for rebuttals and then I'll have one more and then we'll move on. Hmm. Um, okay, I think I'm ready. All right, time begins now. All right, so um, Jacob, he brought up the idea of laws, like the laws of physics are as if they were evidence of a, a divine mind, a divine lawgiver. I think that this argument fundamentally rests upon an equivocation fallacy. An equivocation fallacy is when you kind of, you're wishy-washy with the definition of your words. Sometimes words have more than one definition and you can kind of hijack different definitions to make your argument sound better. There's a confusion here. The laws of physics are just patterns. We go out into the world, we see the planets moving and we can calculate a pattern. Just because we can calculate patterns doesn't necessitate some divine mind behind those patterns. Um, and back to the argument about necessity versus randomness. I, I don't find the disagreement with necessity very persuasive, but I don't exactly go that direction with my perspective of reality. But just an example to kind of make you think about this necessity thing. If you had a deck of playing cards and you're playing poker with it or whatever, if every single card in that deck was the same card, every time you draw a card, 
by necessity, you're getting the same thing. Uh, it's possible that the way reality is, things just ne necessarily occur. This is back to the, uh, the gaps. This is our ignorance. Hopefully we'll come to understand this better, but it's at no point is, is this good evidence for God when the, the evidence against God is already stacked against him or her for that matter. Um, and the whole idea of randomness, yes, maybe the universe does come from random processes, but random processes can be conjoined with selection. And so when random processes are conjoined with selection, that's when we get interesting illusions of fine tuning. And I have yet to see or hear uh, any arguments against why selection can't help provide this illusion of fine tuning. I yield back my time. Okay. Okay. So I just want everyone to look at this and recognize that at, at the core of this, for all that's been said about religions, their direction and all that, we can boil this down to the, the design or chance question, right? Either those are the only two options. Okay. Even uh, Seth has to admit that if evolution happens, it has to emerge because of random processes. He has to make the argument that all of this is because of random chance, okay? There's no other alternative. Evolution does not explain itself, right? The principle of selection even only happens within certain physical parameters that exist. So to say that, the, that, that oh, evolution explains all this is just to wave the magical wand of what I call evolution of the gaps. If you don't know something, evolution did it. OK, now religions, it's true, historically have had models to try and understand reality and certain uh, descriptions were given by people doing the best that they could to understand it. Well, what's interesting is, is that it was science that emerged from a religious context and that that then created a new way of describing physical reality. But are we to assume that physical reality, the reductionist materialist view of the world is the only valid way of of looking at reality does that constitute the whole of reality it doesn't and again just to go back to the argument science well real quick science though is a model for under and, and an explanation to causation within the physical universe and we do find that all of this is governed by physical laws but that only asks the question why do we have physical laws instead of physical randomness why does the pool table why doesn't it look like this? This is the way the universe should be. It shouldn't look something like this. It shouldn't be organized and orderly, yet that is what it is. Now, Seth may say, oh, well, you know, if it was God, he would, uh, you know, it'd be a lot nicer. It'd be a lot better. But that is assumptions that Seth is making about the nature of God, okay? that That's a separate from this discussion entirely. It's a distraction. The question is, why is it organized at all? Why is it not total chaos? And for him to say that, oh, well, and we're not talking about like something, this is actually more probable. The I love you example with pool balls happening randomly, that's way more probable than that the universe was as finely tuned as it is. So when you find something like this on a pool table, you infer based on what you do know, not a God of the gaps argument, that this didn't happen by random chance. Yet Seth sees something that's far more complex than this, and he goes, well, it must be random chance. But that isn't because of the evidence or because of good logic. It's because of Seth and the other atheists out there. It's because of their bias, okay? So what's really happening is, is that there is a gap, and he's filling it with an atheism of the gap where we're looking at making an inference based on what we do know about what creates fine tuning in the universe. And that's mind. And we're saying that the best explanation for the nature of the universe that we inhabit is that a mind is behind that organized order um, because order does not emerge from pure chaos. Order emerges from a mind that puts it there. Um, let me see if there's anything else. The remainder of my time, I believe that's it. I believe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Very good. All righty. So now we will have a 10-minute uh, cross-examination.
Seth has requested that we also make a quick alteration where I'll, I'll be the first actually to cross-examine and then he will be the second uh, to cross-examine. So we are switching up the order a little bit in this round. So uh, with that, um, I will begin my time and begin the questioning. All right, Seth. So um, why do you think the universe is not random chaos? Like why, why do you think that the universe is ordered? Well, I do think that it's fundamentally random, but I think that there are selection pressures that make it look less random. Okay, and where do these selection pressures come from? The, the, the structure of reality, call it metaphysics, if you like, call it physics. Okay, so so from physics, and, and physics ultimately emerges because of the constants and quantities of, of the fine-tuned universe? Well, I, I, behind physics is going to be metaphysics, and within metaphysics are some principles that are perhaps yet to be discovered that lead to physics. So do you feel like you're moving into an, uh, an evolution or naturalism of the gaps fallacy there, considering that you don't know what th those things are? You're just saying like, well, I, I'm assuming because of my metaphysical worldview that, mm -hmm. that that is the case, that they're going to be natural explanations and there couldn't be an intelligent agent behind it? Um, so that hypothetically, there could be an intelligent agent behind it, but we're, we're talking about areas of human ignorance, right? When you're dealing with human ignorance, you have to kind of use a little bit of inductive reasoning, kind of, you have to sense, get a feel for the patterns, right? And when it comes to evolution of the gaps, well, that's actually a very successful argument. Evolution works across many different fields of study. And so inductively, we can see a pattern where the evolutionary argument is constantly being substantiated across many domains. And so we can conclude from this pattern that if it works everywhere else, why wouldn't it work here at the level of metaphysics as well? Well, do you think if, if I had a machine that made something like an automated car machine that made a car, um, would it make sense for me to say that an automated machine made that machine and that an automated machine made that machine? If evolution is like a machine that produces things based on the way that it's programmed, essentially, it, it, is it basically evolution all the way down, like turtles all the way down, but in this case, machines all the way down, just randomly making machines? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say that the evolution all the way down argument has inductive justifications behind it. and theism at rock bottom just doesn't. Okay. So you, you would argue then that the universe ultimately emerged as the problem of random chance and random chance is what gave us the evolutionary processes. Uh, a random chance in conjunction with selection. Yes. Okay. So chemistry came from physics, correct? Yes. And you're saying that physics arose out of random chance and that the fine tuning of the universe is, is ultimately just the product of random chance. Yeah. Well, we don't know. I, not, nobody knows exactly what is bringing forth this illusion of fine tuning, but um, it would make sense to posit that at the metaphysical layer is a conjunction of randomness and selection, which is producing this universe. Okay. Um, do minds produce finely tuned things? Uh, yeah, minds can design things, yeah. Yeah, so minds can produce finely tuned things. So sure. why is it unreasonable to think that if you find something that's finely tuned, that it was the product of a mind? If I found a pocket watch on a beach, mm. what I would, I would not assume that mm. that had arisen by... Uh, natural selection acting on random variations, I would assume a designer because of the improbability of those physical particles coming together in that exact way. So the question is, is why do you look at the universe, which is even more fine tuned than a pocket watch and assume that it must have been uh, some random process rather than it was designed, given that we know that fine tuning is produced by mind? ultimately. So I would disagree with that last sentence. That's where the issue is. I would say that fine tuning is produced both by evolutionary processes and by minds. 
And so when we see an example of fine tuning, we have to say, did this, are, are there any evolutionary pressures here? Or in the absence of evolutionary pressures, maybe it was designed or maybe it was necessity, right? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, but isn't that it's kind of circular reasoning because you're saying that you you say that machines produce finely tuned things, but then we're asking about the machines themselves, right? Because mm -hmm. it, it, you can't say, well, machines produce. It'd be like it'd be like me saying, you know, if I if I, and I'm, I'm going to ask this in a question form, wouldn't that be like me saying, hey, this machine produced cars, therefore, and those cars are finely tuned, therefore, um, the machine must have been produced by a machine who is produced by a machine ad infinitum all the way back. Is that sort of the line of logic that you're saying? Is that that evolution produces evolution produces evolution? Or is there at some point where evolution isn't involved and it's just pure chance? So what what when in the specific analogy of the machine producing the cars, what we would want to do is to look at the structure of the factory. And we would want to say, how, how, what is the causal structure behind this factory? If we can find if we can find reproductive mechanisms, if this factory has a genetic code, and if there's some super factory that's producing factories based on machine genetic code, we might have evidence of machine evolution. But if we look at the structure of the factory and there's no evidence of evolution, then we could say maybe it's not evolution, maybe it's design. Okay. And then do we have any evidence that the constants and quantities at the basis of physics arose from a reproductive cycle? We have inductive reasoning to conclude evolution is a good explanation. Don't we have inductive reasoning to conclude that design is an even better explanation because it doesn't have to be circular? No, no, because you look at biology for millennia, people have been thinking that biology is by, by divine design that the structure of a human is because of the mind of God, but we have debunked all of these divine fine-tuning arguments. And so theism is constantly moving the goalpost. It's no longer biology. Now we're gonna talk about the universe being designed. We know the track record of these goal, uh, God of the gaps arguments. Okay. Um, so ultimately uh, the, let me ask this question. Um, so why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah, th those are those are the mysteries of human ignorance, right? Or there's a lot of people trying to think it out. Maybe it's necessity, maybe something else. We don't really know. Okay. And does our does does do you see order? Um, uh, so, so you say that the machines produce, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to pull up this timer here. It's just want to make sure we're on time. Um, so at the base of the universe are the laws of physics. And do you agree that they emerged at a particular time in the, in the remote past? Um, for this universe, that seems like a reasonable assumption. Yeah. Do you have evidence of any other universe existing? Um, I don't, no. So why do you, if there was no design inference that people were making, w would people posit other universes? Like on what grounds are people positing that there exists other other universes? Well, because this is a big question, right? We This is human ignorance. And when you're dealing with human ignorance, you got to come up with hypotheses. And theism, they've already got one hypothesis, and now there's more hypotheses, and we're trying to judge the hypotheses against each other. Okay. And so this is purely speculation. Do you think, do you think that the um that the multiverse would have been posited if the design uh if people hadn't posited design as a as a viable alternative? Like why did they come up with the multiverse at all? <laughs> Yeah, that's that. That's that's an impossible question in some respects because theism has been a part of our history. It's like, what would the world be like if theism never existed, right? Um, but from what I've seen, there seems to be reasonable 
explanations for why people are going to these hypotheses. It doesn't seem to be just hatred for God or trying to debunk theism. It seems like there's actually good reasons behind it. Okay. Uh, and that is the 10 minutes. So I'll go ahead and stop the time. Okay. All right. All right, Jacob. Let's see. So first of all, do you grant that necessity is a possible, uh, possible, um, as a possibility into your premises? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and do you accept that randomness can be conjoined with selection to produce the illusion of fine tuning? I don't grant that. I don't see any reason to believe that randomness can produce the necessary order that would produce a machine, which is essentially what uh, I view evolution as. It's a, it's a type of machine that exists within the physical order. And so the, the, the question is, it sort of begs the question of well, what created the order uh, itself that allows for this machine to exist. Mm -hmm. So just to try to dig a little deeper onto that, um, if there was if there was an example of bacteria and the bacteria were mutating and the bacteria are in a desert, one of the mutations requires more water, one of the mutations uh, does nothing, one of the mutations requires less water. Do you see how there could be a selection process that would guide it towards fine-tuned for deserts? Yeah, absolutely. But but there's a more fundamental issue here, and that is that there's a desert, and that mm -hmm. there exists not only that that there exists bacteria with the ability to reproduce. That there exists chemistry in this process, and you have to ask mm -hmm. yourself, well, where does this chemistry come from? Ultimately, it isn't random. Like like chemistry isn't random. Chemistry actually is very finely tuned. And again, it's finely tuned based on the laws of physics, which again emerges from something that is finely tuned. And we have no reason to believe that that fine tuning of those physical laws are, are you know, it, the universe didn't have to be that way. There didn't have to be bacteria. There didn't have to be any of that. Yet it's there. And not only is it there, it's not chaos. It is... It is actually orderly and 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 produces these these machines, these selection pressures, and all the rest of it. Right. Okay. So, if we're going to talk back to the layer of uh, cosmology, we could posit a scenario where universes have a genetic code, and the details of the genetic code are the physical constants. Right. And so if we have reproducing universes that reproduce via black holes, and when a black hole is born, new genetic codes are inside that black hole, that black hole gives rise to a new universe that has a new genetic code with new constants. Can you see how some universes that have their constants messed up fail to produce black holes and fail to reproduce? Yeah, I mean, if you want to produce essentially an unlimited number of dice rolls, then yeah, anything's possible. Any possible universe actually that is possible actually exists. So what you do is you just erase all probability. It's it's in my mind, this is just kind of a cheap trick to be like, well, if I have a bunch of royal flushes just over and over and over, and then you kind of be, well, in some universe, this had to have happened because of, you know, if you get enough kind of reproducing universe, you're eventually going to get one. So this isn't surprising at all. This is just the way that it is. And so if you want to basically create all of the possible possibilities that are out there, that also means there's a universe with flying unicorns. And maybe there's a universe in which the church is true, because in some, in some universe, there's ev everything that is possible will be actual. Because in some universe, the laws of nature could be in such a way that you have flying unicorns and leprechauns who fly through walls and all of those kinds of things. So what I see is that it proves too much. And it's basically saying, look, we can't explain this. We have a set of 100 royal flushes in the row at the base of physics. So you say, well, 
rather than go to Occam's razor, which would say, what is the simplest solution to this? What do we know from our uniform experience is that this is caused by, um, that this is caused by intelligent, uh, mind that mind causes these sorts of improbable events. You say, well, maybe there's just an infinite number of chances. Then so that explains it. And there's no evidence for that. And it leads to absurd philosophical conclusions. So in drawing out this analogy, I was hoping to highlight how the necessity for black holes was a selection pressure on this level of metaphysics. And so if we are to grant this level of selection pressure, where only the universe is compatible with black holes can exist, don't you think that that would lead to the conclusion that not all possibilities arise, only the possibilities compatible with selecting for black holes will arise? Yeah, the, the issue is, is that black holes themselves exist in a universe that's finely tuned based on particular laws of physics that exist. And so again, you're just, it, it always is, you, you go back a step to where you say, well, um, you're basically just pushing the evolutionary thing back over and over and over with the assumption that it just has to continue with forever. But the problem is, is that you don't have to have the black holes. You don't have to have any of this stuff. None of this has to exist. And the thing is, is that it does exist and the only thing that we know that actually exists according to science exists based on a finely tuned order. And so when you start going outside of that, you're just walking into a realm of pure speculation rather than an inference to the best explanation based on what we actually know. And that is that finely tuned things are produced by minds and that, and I'm not assuming that evolution itself that the machines that produce finely tuned things are themselves producing themselves, that, that they ultimately came about by random processes, where you seem to make the assumption that evolution at its root just came about by random processes without any evidence for how that, came, that happened. Mm. All right. So to the point about this uh, evolution within the context of metaphysics, would you grant that... Um, you don't really know either way if evolution is impossible at that level. Um, I think the best inference is that machines don't produce machines all the way back. At some point, you have to point to something random causing it. And so ultimately, as I said in my first premise, it's either ultimately, ultimately, it was caused by design or by chance. And when I see a, a, a robot making cars, I, you're right. There wasn't a mind actually making the car, but I know that at bottom that, that robot didn't come about by chance. That robot came about by design. And so you're inferring that robots evolution came about by pure chance. Whereas I'm saying that the better inference based on what we know is that these sorts of things come about based on fine tuning, which is the product of mind. So you mentioned Occam's razor. Why do you think that a divine mind that has almost all knowledge, almost all power, that can do all these things, why would you view that as a simple ontological conclusion as opposed to a natural bottoms up evolution? Because, because the universe is indeed finely tuned. So, and because that is the simplest explanation for fine tuning. For example, if I had someone who was, uh, if I was watching security footage of someone breaking into a safe and they walked up to the safe and they just put in the code and it was like a 15 digit code and they just put it in one time, I would have to conclude that this was an inside job. Somebody gave him that code it's a much more wild explanation, a less simple explanation to say that the reason that code came about in the exact way was just by random chance, right? Design, when you have high levels of improbability, is actually the simpler explanation to that improbability than is uh, random chance. So 
yeah, I, I would think that that is the better, um, better one. And, and, uh, we do have time for one more question. So we're at oh. the, at the time. All right. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to get a little more clarity on a, a, a divine mind would theoretically be very complex and I'm not seeing how this is a simple, uh, solution. Uh, to that, I would just say that it is a, um, it, it is a simpler explanation to say that that a mind causes high complex or uh, improbable events, like someone cracking the safe, which is highly improbable that it would happen by chance. When those are the two options, we have to consider that it isn't. Oh well, it seems to be complex. The issue is amongst the options available. What's more complex even than a mind is that somebody walks in and takes a safe and is able to open it by pure chance. That's a much more complex uh, thing. So with that, I believe that's the time that's that's up for this round. Is that, that good? Yeah, very good. All righty. So um, you can go ahead and uh, prepare for your closing statement. You'll have eight minutes. And I will begin that time uh, when right. you're ready. All right, I think I'm ready. Okay, let me go ahead and start the timer right now. All right, so um, I think as you've seen, uh, a lot of this debate has kind of centered around fine tuning. We've gone back and forth on this issue. To me, at least, it seems obvious that a divine mind is not a good explanation. Divine minds they're almost infinitely complex. How can they know everything? How can they have all power? And we know from the patterns of existence that things usually have causation. Where does God come from? What, what is the cause that brings God into being? Theists usually just assert God and they don't have explanations for why he came into existence. So to me, that's not a satisfying conclusion. But this is very metaphysical. This is the area of ignorance. There is freedom to disagree. But unfortunately, we didn't get to discuss a lot of the issues that I brought up. Uh, I, perhaps Jacob has a lot to say on these that we didn't get a chance to discuss. But to me, it still seems quite obvious that mythology does not provide a good basis for theism understanding reality. Uh, spiritual experiences don't provide a good basis for understanding reality. The history of morality itself, all of the track record of failures in morality seem to show that they're not tapping into what they think they're tapping into. And the whole idea of proving a negative. To me, this is the most devastating argument against theism because if theism can be proven to be a contradiction, it can't exist. Or the God that is a contradiction cannot exist. So if theists are believing in something that doesn't exist, they're seeing a pattern that isn't there. And we know that overactive pattern recognition will lead people to these false conclusions. And back to the thought experiment testing scenario, right? My challenge was come up with a definition of God and test it. See if you can find any definition that's not a contradiction. I don't think it's possible, but maybe someone has yet to prove me wrong. And we can just do a, a few of these examples just to get a feel for how damning this is for theism. So the most simple thought experiment is involving the problem of evil. The problem of evil is basically the argument that if God is all powerful, if God is all knowing, then, and if God is omnibenevolent, right? If God is really good, then God should use his power to get rid of all the evil, right? And so when we form this thought experiment, we say, if God is all powerful, if he knows everything, if he is omnibenevolent, then what should we find in the world? We should find no evil. And so now we test the thought experiment, we go into the world, we look around and we find evidence of evil. That debunks the definition of God. It contradicts the prediction that follows from that definition of God. So maybe 
theists will jump to a new definition. Ha ha. That definition of God doesn't have enough nuance. Let's uh, spice up the definition of God a bit. A typical argument theists will put forward is, ah, yes, God has those, those attributes, omnibenevolent, omnip omnipotent, omniscient, but God, he set everything up to be a test. He's giving everyone free will, and he's just testing us, right? And so the fact that this is a test, that requires the evil, right? And so they think they're being tricky. They think they've uh, squirreled their way out of the problem. Well, let's continue the thought experiment. If God is a God of tests, what should the world look like? Let's make a prediction and test it. Well, if, this, if God is a God of tests, we should expect reality to look like a test. Okay, let's go out into the world and let's observe. Does it look like a test? Hmm. Well, that, that's odd. When we look into the world, we find babies and children that are dying before they even get the test started. How does that make sense if this is a test? We also find people that are born in the wrong nations that have the wrong textbook for the test. That doesn't seem fair. Uh, we find people that are born into positions of advantage that give them an unfair advantage on the test. And, well, what are we testing exactly? I think that a rigorous study of the concept of free will will prove that it doesn't even exist in the first place. If there's no free will, what's, what's the point of this test? It's not actually testing anything. And if this is actually a test, we should expect that everyone is kind of going through the same problems, right? Like in a multiple choice, everyone's got the same quiz. Well, does everyone have the same tests in this life? Some people have unique disabilities. Some people have learning disabilities. Some people are born with unfortunate circumstances that give them trauma and warp their perspective of the world. And what are we testing? Are we like testing heroism? Is there a universal test of heroism? Does everyone go through a stage in their life where, ha ha, I passed the heroism test, on to the next problem. Now we've got the charity test. Dun, dun, dun. Is everyone going through the same test or does everyone have random experiences? I think that if we have an unbiased look at the world, we'll find that everything kind of looks random. People have random experiences. They have random diseases. Uh, we look into the universe. All the different planets seem random. They're not fine-tuned for anything except being a void of nothing. And so my challenge to theists would be come up with the definition of God, make some predictions, and go test it. See if your God can stand the rigor of, testa of testation. And so in conclusion, I think we can, I think it's pretty obvious that if we look at the epistemology of theism from any different angle, it's got a bad track record. It's constantly getting debunked. It's constantly getting things wrong. And when we look at non-God epistemologies, when we're looking at science, when we're coming up with natural explanations, there's just a track record of continual progress, continual marching into the unknown, continual discovery. And I think we have no reason to think anything is going to change about those trajectories. And therefore, I would conclude that atheism explains reality better than theism. Okay. Thank you very much. And now I will go ahead and begin mine. If you want to get the, you want to get the timer ready. Yeah, I'm ready when you are. All righty. And all right, let's go. All righty, everybody. So uh, my opponent tonight has uh, talked a little bit about sort of this, this idea that there's this onward march of progress in science and that science seems to answer all of these questions. And the reality is that science does indeed answer questions about the physical universe beautifully. And it actually does it because science emerged from a religious tradition that was expecting to find law in nature. 
And that's exactly what we did find. So what we didn't find in nature was random chaos. What we found in nature was law. There are laws that govern the physical world. But is the physical world all that there is? No. There's even my opponent admits there's a metaphysical reality. And that metaphysical reality is also governed by law. So religion doesn't just deal with the physical aspect of our reality. It also deals with the metaphysical aspect of our reality. And in fact, I think you can make the case, and I would make the case, and I have in my videos in the past, made the case that religion and specifically the Judeo-Christian tradition has led to immense moral progress. It's the reason that we have science and ultimately is a deeper, more fundamental fount of knowledge than is reductive materialist atheism, which merely, it's like having one, it is valid, but it's like you have one eye closed. You're just looking at the physical. But that's the crazy thing. I actually, in this debate, I went onto the home turf of the atheist into not talking about metaphysics, not talking about morality, not talking about any of that. I'm talking about the physical universe. <clears throat> and if even the physical universe is best explained by uh, 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 an appeal to a mind or whether it is best explained as an appeal to um, random chance. And I made the argument. And my opponent tonight, unfortunately, has failed. He has failed because he has not refuted this argument. He has not refuted premise one. Anything that comes into existence is either the product of random chance or design. He tried to make an appeal to evolution, but ultimately my opponent has to admit, along with everyone, that evolution is not it exists within a reality, and that reality must either be the product of random chance or of design. And as I have demonstrated tonight, the best explanation for the physical reality within which op, uh, evolutionary processes exist is not the product of random chance, but of a finely tuned universe that is best explained in reference to a designer. So premise one holds. He did not provide a third option to refute this premise, okay? So premise one is true. The known universe came into existence. I don't even think that my uh, my opponent disputes that. Uh, I don't think Seth disputed the fact that our universe did emerge. He thinks it might've emerged from some sort of a multiverse generator or something like that, but it did come into existence. And then the known universe is not the product of random chance is my third premise, okay? so. My opponent has claimed that, well, evolution and evolutionary processes are what have basically produced the universe that we currently know. But again, it's this circular argument that says evolution produced evolution. You ultimately have to justify the machine that is doing the production. He is essentially saying, look, here's a machine that made cars. A machine must have made that machine. But that is contrary to the scientific evidence of the fine-tuning of the universe. Um, what you find in the universe is that it is uh, finely tuned according to the constants and quantities of the universe. That is the reason that we have physics. And the reason from those finely tuned parameters of physics, that is where chemistry emerges and a biology emerges from that. So... At some point, he has to either appeal to random chance or to design. And I think my opponent alluded to, though he didn't want to, to the idea, well, at some point at root, it must have been uh, random chance. But this is just a bias presupposition that he brings to the table. It isn't actually grappling with what we do know about physical reality. So don't get distracted by sort of the arguments of like, for instance, the argument from evil or, or that kind of stuff against why. Those are theological questions. This debate is not about the nature of God. It is about whether or not in the broadest sense, in the broadest sense possible, if the universe that we inhabit, and in this case, I'm talking about the physical universe, if that is best explained as the product of chance or the product of design. And where you have design, you have a designer. So to summarize, I think what I, I think one of the things that any of us should do is look in the mirror, as I had said before. Um, and recognize that this doesn't have to be here. You don't have to be here. 
consciousness does not have to be here. Your relationships don't have to be here. The physical and the metaphysical does not have to be here. But here it is. And not only is it here, it's not random chaos. Again, what we see is not this, it's something more akin to this. It's a universe of order, not a universe where particles are randomly bouncing around off of each other with no rhyme or reason. And it begs the question, why do we live in an ordered cosmos instead of a random cosmos? And what you find is that the it's as if you found a ton of dice that are all there with the pattern of six on top. And it's hundreds of thousands of dice that are this way. Remember, my opponent ultimately is saying, well, they must have got here by chance. They must have ultimately got, maybe some process came in and turned them all into this position. And that process just is random. But I don't have that much faith. When I see, if I were to walk into a room that has 10,000 dice all with the number six on it, I would rightfully infer when we talk about what do we infer? Well, we infer to the best explanation, to Occam's razor. The best explanation if you walk into a room and you find something that's incredibly fine-tuned is that it didn't happen by random chance. It happened by design. And that is what we see in the universe. And that's my argument. And that is why ultimately the universe is best described as the product of design rather than the product of chance. And design comes from a mind. And the only thing that, it can, that can account for a mind behind the universe is theism. And so people should explore it. And I think that that provides the best explanation in this debate. And with that, I yield my time. All right. Seth, Thank thanks you. so much for coming on. Um, that was fun. Real quick, just if people want to find you, let's, let's uh, have you give a plug for where they can find you online and then we'll close this out. Yeah, um, my channel is on YouTube and it's called Transcendent Philosophy. There's like a little logo of like a dragon. So you can find me there. And I'm also on Facebook and um, and the blog is should be referenced on the YouTube channel. Just go to the about section. You'll find all my links from there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Seth. Hope you have a great day, man. You too, Jacob. Take care. All righty. Take care. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.